<laughs> hey guys, it's like I'm, so I think, hopefully that's a bit better, yeah. Um, hello everybody, wow, we're live, and welcome, what a day. <laughs> um, I'm just going to give everyone a bit of uh, time to settle down, catch a breath, and make sure we're really live, which looks, and I can see people starting to join in, so thanks so much, and welcome. So yes, welcome to another Earth Lesson Live, um, courtesy of the amazing Lizzie Daly. Thank you, Lizzie, for inviting me here to these lessons. And thank you all as well for pitching up for the next 20 minutes. I've got 20 minutes. And um, yeah, so thanks for coming. My name is Gillian Burke. I'm a biologist. Um, I'm a writer as well. I'm a wildlife presenter. And yeah, I'm a presenter on BBC Two shows, Spring Watch, Autumn Watch, Winter Watch. For UK viewers, you'll be familiar with that. For people joining from around the globe, that is basically, it's um, a seasonal live wildlife show here in the UK. And we um, follow the wildlife and track changes across the seasons. Lots of fun. It's live telly with wildlife, so it gets interesting sometimes. Um, but that's what I do. Um, I'm also a mom, I'm a parent, and today is the first day here in the UK where um, we've had our school closures. And at the end of last week, I think there was an estimated 1 billion children out of school. So the school age children in the UK have just joined that gang. So it's been an interesting day, and I can tell you that much as a parent. <laughs> So yeah, like I said, I'm a biologist, I'm a parent, I'm also an outdoors person. And I live in a really beautiful part of the UK. I live in Cornwall, and it's the sort of very southwestern tip of the country. It's the peninsula that sort of looks like it's kind of leaning off into the country. I always imagine that like it's leaning off the mainland, like it's trying to make a break for warmer climates in the, in the south. Um, so that's where I live. And normally if I was doing something like this, I would love to try and get outdoors. Obviously, outdoors is out of bounds. So it's been a bit of a challenge to come up with 20 minutes of um, a lesson, which is about inspiring people to connect with nature um, from indoors. But actually, do you know what? I have loved the challenge because it's really made me look around my, my house. And as you might be able to see behind me, I like to collect sort of what I call little sort of um, natural curiosities I have done over years and years of traveling and wildlife filming and pretty much like every so I don't just keep a nature table like every surface is um covered with little things little you know sort of curiosities or tchotchkes I think tchotchke is a Polish word I don't know maybe someone can verify that but yes so I have a lot of them so I've decided to use just one or two props from around the house to um lead me into some stories like talking points um, which I hope will help you to see things um, a little differently and, and maybe appreciate some of the things that maybe people um, love to hate, as I call them, but, you know, the sort of the things that aren't cute and cuddly. So I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to delve because I promised snakes and spiders, didn't I? In the title, so I'm going to start with this, and I wish I could say it's a live snake, but I don't, I don't have live animals in the house. So what I do have, though, I'm going to try and uncoil this. I don't know if you can see this here. This is the shed skin of um, a snake, and I'll tell you what species it is in a minute. But um, just maybe I need to just tell you a little bit of how I got hold of this because this is a shed skin. This is um, this is what happens when snakes grow. So um, snakes basically, they, they every time they reach a certain size, they've got to like peel their skin off. And what they do is they grow a new fresh layer of skin and scales underneath the old layer, and then they peel the, the old layer off. And it's a bit like sort of like peeling off a sock inside out. And that's exactly what they do as they get ready to shed their skin. They'll find sort of hard, rough surfaces and they'll start to rub their nose and peel off some of the nose no scales and then slowly use things to attach the old skin and they peel that off very much like I said like a sock so this is what I have here and you can see this is a really big snake I mean if I were to stand I'm not going to because you won't be able to see it on the camera but this is actually taller than I am and you know I'm not that tall but I'm not that short either so um, this is a big snake but the giveaway in terms of what species this is is um, it's very hard to see but there you can see the two eye, the scales that would have covered the eyes of this snake. And just there are two oblong 
scales, quite memorably called by some people coffin-shaped scales. So this is the, the skin of a species called the black mamba. So a really iconic species. And this is the skin of an individual snake that um, I actually had the pleasure to, I guess, see in the flesh um, on a film shoot, one of my very, very first film shoots. So um, donkeys years ago, I worked on a series when I was a researcher, before I was a presenter, and I worked on a series called Snake Master, and it was on Animal Planet. And as the snake suggests, we went around the world filming all kinds of really iconic snake species. So things like anacondas, reticulated pythons, bushmasters, black mambas, of course. But we also filmed what I consider to be the, um, well, actually not just me, loads of people would agree with this, the king of snakes, the king cobra. And um, it was one of the very first shoots I set up for this for this series, and I had set up the whole shoot as a researcher, um, but maybe that's taking a bit much credit, but you know, I set up a lot of the shoot as the researcher. And but from the comfort and safety of the desk in the production office in Bristol. It wasn't until we traveled out to India, which is where King Cobras are found, um, that it occurred to me that I had never really spent a lot of time around snakes. I had no idea what I'd be like with a real life snake. Um, not that I necessarily had to wrangle or handle these things, but um, I did have to be in their presence. So I would say it was a bit of a baptism of fire um, because king cobras are formidable. They're amazing snakes. Obviously, um, they're famous for their venom. They're famous for hooding, um, you know, rearing up and standing sort of, you know, sort of at eye level, being able to like eyeball somebody. You know, they're all these tails. And yes, they're true. I mean, if you threaten a king cobra, that's what it's going to do. But of course, um, that's not what we were there to film. We wanted to film it in, in its natural behavior when it's relaxed and calm, things like courtship and mating. And it was such a treat for me because once I kind of got over the initial kind of awesomeness of this snake, and I, you know, I was scared, I'll be honest. Um, but once I got over that, what I and all of us on that crew got to see was, um, a snake that was sort of so unlike its reputation. And it was really quite curious animal. Um, the way it moved around, it sort of looked like a rat snake, actually, to be honest, when it wasn't hooding up. And um, it looked um, almost cat-like in its movements. It would sort of nose around and sort of stop and sort of cock its head to one side and then the other side and a little bit of tongue flicking to smell whatever it was. And if something kind of caught its attention, you know, further away, it would sort of pop its head up and look over the grass. And when it was satisfied that this wasn't a threat, it would carry on with its business. So, you, you know, for me, that was one of the first experiences I had of um, being able to see past the kind of um, the sensationalism around this particular snake and snakes in general, and to see them doing what they would do when they're not feeling threatened. Um, it was such, um, it was a real privilege, you know. I know that they are, you know, frightening snakes, and rightly so. Um, they have really neurotoxic venom. But, you know, when when observing them, and I to say this is true for all sorts of wildlife, observing them in their natural habitat, undisturbed, um, is such a treat. And particularly with these king cobras, what I, what I felt, and I still do, is they were remarkable, beautiful things, of course, um, commanding the utmost respect, obviously. Um, so, you know, that was, like I said, it was amazing to get to see these animals just kind of generally being chill, you know, it was really great. Um, so, you know, I wanted to share that story with you because it was one of my first experiences of um, being able to connect and relate to something that should be. So that's something exotic for you. Um, I thought I'm just put this somewhere safe because this is one of my prized possessions. I've had that for many years and it's doing really well. I've managed to keep it really intact. But um, behind me is, I'm going to try and do this without crashing loads of stuff. Um, I, I collect feathers, <laughs> loads of feathers all over the place. Um, so I thought I would sort of bring something that maybe is a little bit more familiar and I would challenge that I would say every single person, I don't, you know, whether you're living in like a sprawling metropolis or out in the sticks, but I would challenge, I bet someone's going to prove me wrong, <laughs> that every single, you know, all, like I said, I collect feathers. I've just got a few here. I mean, this one is um, from the pheasant. Uh, this one here is, this is a lovely one, I think. This is a guinea. But I think feathers 
um, are as wondrous as anything as exotic as a king cobra. You know, this is a structure in nature. And um, in my book, yeah, like I said, there's a real wonder of nature. Because if you look at this, this is sort of um, a basic template. Every feather sort of has this basic template of the shaft down the middle and the veins sort of branching off it. And from this basic template, you get um, all sorts of amazing design and structure and function. So you get um, the fluffy downy feathers that are sort of keep a bird warm. You get like the flight feathers very similar to this one, but you also get sort of feathers that are sort of different colors um, for display and for, um, you know, courtship and mating, displaying like fending off rivals, all kinds of things. Um, so that's what they do, but also, you know, feathers are incredibly strong. Um, they withstand incredible forces like forces like this flight feather um, in flight, yet they're really light, light as a feather. So, you know, that's an incredible structure by design, you know, nature by design. But I think, to be honest, one of the most wondrous things of all is that once a feather is no longer needed, once it's discarded, whatever, um, it just disappears without a trace. And I think that is pretty amazing. I think if we humans, could start designing like that, wouldn't that be clever? So yes, the wonders of nature, I'm just gonna put those to one side. Um, I just think, you know, well maybe, you know what, I tell you what, I think I've talked quite a bit, I've just realized I've only got 20 minutes, I'm used to having more time. <laughs> so I just thought, let's have a look. I was just looking at some of the comments here. Um, hey Kayla, hi. Wildlife Animally, oh, so great. Thanks so much, um, guys, for reaching out. What's my favorite wildlife encounter in Spring Watch? Hmm, you know, that's like a really, I bet you I would have a different answer on every different day, depending on my mood. Um, I've loved, I love all of it, really. I know that's a really bad answer, but I would say, um, Emily, yeah, my favorite is probably, still the ladybird spider um, that I had the incredible privilege of seeing. Um, I'm, You know what I'm gonna do, cause I was actually gonna talk about, I'm gonna post that onto my Instagram account, um, some a clip from that if I can. I'll do that as soon as I finish this so that you can see what I'm talking about. The ladybird spider was, um, it's such a rare spider, it almost went extinct. It was down to a handful of individuals um, in a known site in, in the south of the country, in Britain, I mean. And um, it was brought back from the brink of extinction in Britain by a handful of really, really dedicated conservationists. And I got to see these precious things. Um, the male is a beautiful thing. Um, it, he's sort of as the name would suggest, a bright red and without fail, that clip always gets a gasp from people in a good way. And I tell you what, I get such a kick out of that every single time. I promise as soon as I get off this, I'm going to post that on my Instagram. Um, and yeah, come and, come and find it there. So yeah, that's my favorite wildlife encounter. Um, are there any more questions? Yes, oh my goodness. Okay. Um, Let's see, we've got James Radcliffe. What advice would I give somebody wanting to get into wildlife presenting? Wow, well, you know what, James, I don't think there has ever been a more important time um, and a better complex system that's called life on earth. And we're very lucky to be that. So um, what advice would I give? You know, there are so many platforms and ways to reach out. Um, the main thing I would say is, you know, um, really honor what you feel is your voice you know and and don't be tempted because it is trust me <laughs> be tempted to um you know emulate you know be who you are i know like it, so many people give that advice and actually being yourself is one of the hardest things as i've also discovered um but you know just be yourself as much as possible because you are unique and um you know, I'm really happy to give more advice if you want to um, reach out on my Instagram. I do have Twitter and all that and, and stuff, but I tend to mostly be on Instagram. So if you want to reach out on that, you know, by all means, I'm really happy to um, give whatever little advice I can. But I'd really love to see other people get involved, other people get engaged. I feel like one great big community and it's our classic, 
you know, the rising tide um, floats all ships. So I'm really happy to help if anyone, um, James and anyone else wants some advice. Um, are there any other questions? Let's have a look. Um, so um, I'm from the UK. What wildlife would you recommend going out to see in my garden? Well, at the moment, I guess, you know, for a lot of us, that's probably the only place, if you're lucky enough to have a garden, um, the only place to go out and look. Um, a very simple thing, actually, that you could do, whether you have a garden or whether you're not, if you have even like a flower box or just a little courtyard or just a little area where you have some plant pots, very likely you're going to have some kind of invertebrate life in there. And if you do, you may have earthworms. And I tell you what, earthworms are quite extraordinary. In fact, all the kind of invertebrate life that live in soils and the soil communities are brilliant because actually, you know, it it can maybe trigger kind of like a little sort of meditation on how amazing soil is. You can tell I'm really thinking about how to spend and connect with nature <laughs> while staying at home. Um, so yeah, um, earthworms, that sort of thing. There'll be orb web spiders starting to come out in, in the next few weeks and, and keep an eye out for those. I really love them. If you have to, if you have a car and if you have to get in your car, um, another thing to look out for, and I know this is not a garden question, but I love these, but pretty much every wing mirror of every car I've ever looked in um, through the spring and summer has its own resident spider that will build a little orb web um, strapped kind of across the wing mirror and attached to your windscreen check them out, they're really cool. They live behind the actual mirror, the glass, um, but they'll sort of build their webs. And I guess, you know, as you're driving around, you're just like an aerial filter helping them to catch prey. They obviously do well because like I said, virtually every car I've ever looked in has one of those. Oh my gosh, I just realized I've got two minutes left. Um, yeah, if, I'm just gonna see if there's any. James Radcliffe, thanks so much for the advice. You are so welcome. And like I said, please, you know, reach out on Instagram if you want any more advice as well. Um, so, you know, I'm going to start wrapping things up because one of the questions that I think Lizzie, um, one of the, I think, things that Lizzie wanted to inspire with these Earth Live lessons, and thanks again, Lizzie, for arranging this, it's incredible, um, is just the kind of, you know, what drew me to science, and I guess for other speakers on Earth Live um, lessons, that's going to be a question maybe that other people want to answer too. Um, I'm going to do that really quickly because it was like so easy for me. I mean, obviously I'm I'm a naturally curious person. I always have been, and I think everyone is actually to a certain extent. I think science has been hijacked a bit. I think it's now quite easy to get bogged down with all the measuring and the analyzing and the categorizing of things and trying to prove a theory and disprove it. We understand them or not, whether we um, are here or not. And to me, that is just the most exciting thing about it. It's that these things happen regardless of whether we know them, understand them, study them, or measure them, or any of that. So that is a really comforting thought for me. <laughs> and I hope that inspires you guys as well to, um, you know, go deeper in your sort of curiosity about the natural world, about the physical world, about our world, and how all these worlds interact. Um, we are getting close to the end of our session. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'll, I'll take a look at those as well afterwards and hopefully um, catch you guys on my Instagram as well. Um, there will be another Earth Live tomorrow at 4 p.m. It sells itself, doesn't it? <laughs> so again, thank you all so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It went really too quickly, to be honest. So anyway, this is Gillian Burke on Earth Live Lessons courtesy of Lizzie Daly. Thank you so much. Over and out.